Then Jennifer Fernjack. Jennifer Fernjack was raised in Cloquet, Minnesota, currently resides in Spring Park, Minnesota. She received her BA degree from the University of Minnesota Duluth and an MBA from the University of St. Thomas. Through a medical scare in 2016, she learned that things such as music, gratitude, laughter, pets, and actives, acts of kindness can actually lower stress hormones and influence the feel-good chemicals of the brain for patients, survivors, and caregivers. Her messages of hope and emotional grit have been heard at places such as the Mayo Clinic, Health Partners, Neuroscience Center, and the University of Minnesota. They can also be found in her book, Greater, Greater Than, The Power and Strength of Emotional Grit. Please welcome Jennifer Fernjack. Thanks, Mike. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Is this an okay height for the, the mic? So <clears throat> tonight I want to talk about how music is so much more than entertainment. Well, of course, the entertainment value has a lot of, carries a lot of weight too. I know even just being at the, the Fargo event a few weeks ago, just being at the concert and hearing Pete and his band perform, and Night Ranger, of course, as well, it was just, to me, a sense of normalcy, especially after two years during the pandemic of not even going to a concert in person. So the music had a great way of uniting the group. And of course, tomorrow night at the Grand Funk Railroad concert, it'll be the same kind of a thing. But I want to call out the fact that music can actually affect people physically. It's something that can actually not only affect you physically, but also emotionally and cognitively, as I'll show you tonight. So there are, def there are definitely some health benefits to it. Now, the thing about music, though, is that even though it can lower your stress hormones, such as cortisol, and increase the actual feel-good chemicals of the brain, such as dopamine or serotonin, music is also very subjective. So one person's good music is somebody else's noise. <laughs> and so I know that uh, for me, based on when I went to high school, I liked um, old school hip hop bands, and I liked what I called hair bands. <laughs> so, so whether it was LL Cool J or Def Leppard and Bon Jovi or whatever, yeah, I kind of, I kind of liked, liked it all, you know? So, <laughs> so it's pretty amazing how that can affect things. And I know that sometimes uh, different hospitals perhaps a radiation machine or some other kind of a test. And the favorite type of music is, is, a, is a great way to try to appease somebody as they're in kind of an ominous state. But by actually playing their favorite songs, that's a whole other level. And uh, a good example of, a, of that would be, say, for example, you're in a, a hospital room and you don't have a tablet. Like there, there, there's no iPad. You don't have a smartphone. So all you can do is just watch TV on the TV that's in the room. Well, if it's a double room where you're sharing it with a stranger and the two of you are having to share that one TV, the person might think, well, I heard that you liked crime shows, and I'm watching CSI. Isn't that OK? And you might think, well, I I'm more into Law and Order. <laughs> well, it's still a crime show, but it's not your favorite show. And the same thing happens with music. You want the actual stimulus to have a saliency to it, which means it's relevant to you and carries some meaning. I know that uh, with, uh, with music, anything that can actually remind you of maybe your, your time in high school, or your first kiss, or your first time in your brand new car, that kind of music can have some meaning for you. So it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, music can have that kind of an effect on you. I know there are studies that show that uh, premature babies in NIC units could actually have their heart rates lowered when they hear lullabies. They can also have their pain perception affected in a positive way by lullabies. And of course, having their feelings of anxiety reduced as well. So it's pretty cool how they can actually just kind of soothe little infants. As far as adults go, I've also read stories about people, for example, who have Parkinson's disease, Oftentimes, those people will shake as they walk, and it's kind of hard to have a, a normal gait. But if they hear music that's relevant to them, they're actually more apt to dance and not be shaking because those dopamine levels are increasing. So it's interesting how even people with Parkinson's disease, it can make a difference in how they, how they dance versus how they walk. And then regarding dementia, I know that years ago, my mom worked in a nursing home up in Duluth, so up, by, up by Lake Superior. And there were a number of patients who had um, Alzheimer's where they seemed rather agitated and kind of withdrawn, and they just didn't want to really be around anybody. But yet my mom, as the nurse, had to get them to take their prescribed medications. And so she thought, well, you know, if someone seems kind of agitated, how can I get them to take their medications? Well, my mom, now keep in mind, this is before she had access to the internet. <laughs> this is like back in the 1980s, you know. So she learned to wing it, and she learned uh, just from her, her colleagues as well. 
the importance of bringing a tape player to work. So she had a tape player, and she put a tape in there whenever she wanted to get those people to take their medications. And of course, it was music that was relevant to them. So it could be, <clears throat> for example, uh, like big band era music, or maybe a little bit of uh, uh, Bing Crosby, or uh, um, anybody else who's of that, of that era singing. And that way, those people were more apt to relax, because those stress hormones are being reduced, and the feel-good chemicals of the brain were, were increasing. So it was pretty great how she was able to connect with them via their favorite kinds of music. So as I mentioned, music can also affect people cognitively. And there was a study in England a number of years ago where someone went to a supermarket and they had bottles of French wine and bottles of German wine. There were, there were uh, the same number of bottles for each kind of wine. And in addition to having the same number of bottles, they were also similar in price or they were similar in taste, whether it was the dryness or the sweetness of the wine. So they tried to have things equal in that regard. Well, the one thing that was different was the music that was playing. Every other day, the people who were conducting the study would play German music, and on the opposite days, play the French music. Well, the interesting thing about all this is that depending on what kind of music was playing, it made a difference in the kind of wine that someone was buy, would buy. People were much more apt to actually buy French wine the day that the French music was playing, and of course, the German wine on the opposite days. And when asked later if they knew that, uh, what kind of music was playing and if it had any kind of an influence on their, on their purchase, People were like, well, what do you mean? Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, they, they weren't aware of the fact that the music actually subconsciously made a difference in what they were doing. The same thing can be said just for anybody going into a supermarket in general. Whether you're going to Byerly's or Cub Foods or wherever, more often than not, supermarkets oftentimes have really soothing music playing as you're pushing your cart down the aisles. And that's because they want you to actually pay attention to the different labels that are on the food packaging. Whereas if the music had a really upbeat tempo, people are more apt to just push their cart and kind of be in a hurry and just get whatever they think they want and uh, not buy the additional items. So again, it can affect you cognitively. So I've learned over the last few years that the, health, the actual health benefits of music are also being recognized at a community level. I know I've, I've uh, traveled a fair amount for work around the country, and I've noticed at airports, uh, as a matter of fact, this picture on the right side of the screen is a sign at the Minneapolis airport where they're literally asking people in the luggage claim area to play their baby grand piano. <laughs> That's right there. And I've heard people playing the piano for others while they're waiting for their luggage to come in. I've also seen such pianos at the Detroit airport, uh, New Orleans, Charleston, different places. Play that for other people. And how many of you ever shop at Menards? Or whoever have <laughs> shopped at Menards? Well, <clears throat> there's actually a Menards on 394, which is outside Minneapolis, that at the top of the escalator, as you're shopping for PVC pipe <laughs> or two by fours or whatever, they have a baby grand piano. <laughs> and they have people purposely playing the piano for others to have a more relaxing, relaxing experience. So the, the actual benefits of having uh, music playing are also recognized at this community level. So it's pretty interesting. So music can help not only patients at a hospital, but also survivors and caregivers. And some of you might be wondering, well, Jennifer, you know, how, how do you happen to know these things about music? You know, did you like, just do research on your own? And, and more importantly, how could they possibly help you? Well, I can speak to these things firsthand. And that's because this picture that you're seeing of somebody who's laying on a hospital bed, uh, waiting to go into an MRI machine with an IV in their arm of dye, that's me. And <clears throat> this happened back in 2016 after I had an eye exam, as I do every year to get my contact prescription renewed. At the time of the exam, my eye doctor said to me, you know, Jennifer, I'm acting on a hunch, but for the second year in a row, you didn't do as well in your peripheral vision exam. I'd like you to see a specialist. Okay, I, I wasn't worried about it. I couldn't feel anything that was possibly wrong. So I went to the specialist, and then he in turn ran more tests and took pictures of the backs of my eyes. He then said, you know, Jennifer, I'm, again, I'm acting on a hunch, so, so that's the, the, the second person now who's acting on a hunch. And he said, I think something might be pushing on your optic nerve. I'd like you to have an MRI. So I did just that the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. And again, this is in 2016. And the very next day, I got a phone call that I never saw coming. It was the eye specialist with the results of the MRI 
And he said, Jennifer, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. It appears as though you have a brain tumor. My initial thought was that of disbelief because, as I mentioned, I couldn't feel any symptoms of any sort. No headaches, no motor skill problems, no speech impediments, nothing. It was almost like we were talking about a third party. So I got out a pad of paper and a pen, asked lots of questions, took copious notes. But then literally within seconds of getting off the phone, I dropped to my knees and sobbed. My mind went from zero to 60 in just a few seconds as I thought, Am I going to go blind? Am I never going to get married again? Am I going to die? And after about 10 minutes or so of laying on my bedroom floor by myself, just sobbing, I thought to myself, I can't let this consume me. Actually, I won't let it consume me. So I got out my pad of paper and a pen again, and I made a list of reasons why it's positive to have a brain tumor. (laughs) And that might sound kind of counterintuitive, but it was, for me, it was more a way of trying to get a sense of control and kind of have, like, own my situation rather than having it own me. So the list starts with, maybe I'll lose some weight. And then I wrote, maybe I'll meet a hot single doctor. <laughs> and, then, and then it went on, and it got a little bit more somber as I wrote such things as, good reminder to count blessings, good excuse to reach out to people I haven't seen in a while. And then my list got a little bit too somber for me, so I ended it with good excuse to eat dessert first. (laughs) And by making this list, I also learned that just like music, that having a heart full full of gratitude can also lower stress hormones and actually increase the feel-good chemicals of the brain. So it's pretty interesting how that works. And my tumor is called the meningioma. Uh, Basically, it's in the outer lining of the brain that's called the meninges. And mine's between that outer lining and it's between my optic nerve, my pituitary gland, and my carotid artery. So kind of an ominous spot, <laughs> about the size of a golf ball. And people had tried to like, make comments they thought were kind of helpful, <laughs> but not really helpful. And so I learned that perspective was key in my experience. So for example, some people would say to me, well, Jennifer, if, you're, if your tumor supposedly grew for decades, like possibly even like 20, 25 years, don't you wish it was discovered earlier? Because it would have been smaller. And my response is always, no. And then people look surprised. And I'll say, because 20 or 25 years earlier, the technology to treat it would have been different. I'll take today's tumor. (laughs) You know? And so I learned that perspective was just so important. And even though the tumor wasn't cancerous, the the surgeon thankfully had the wisdom to take away half of it, actually actually extract half of it, but leave the remaining half in my head because of the fact that it's, it's actually encasing the carotid artery and then it got radiation treatments. And the radiation treatments were hopefully going to kill the cells. And so the first time that I went in to have a uh, radiation treatment done, I know, uh, well, and actually, I should backtrack for a second. The night before my surgery, uh, you know, I had been warned ahead of time that I might not come out. <laughs> you know, I, I could go into surgery, I could go blind, I could have a blood clot, have a stroke, I, I could die. And so knowing these things, I thought, you know, out of respect for my family, I wanted to go through my burial wishes with them and I wanted to go through my health care directive. So I asked my mom, my dad, and my dad's wife to sit at my dining room table with me as I went through the respective items. And even though I knew logically that that was the right thing to do, emotionally it still weighed on my heart. It was kind of like a reverse thing, like I'm the child telling the parents, you know, and so it just seemed kind of, kind of surreal. So when we were done, I took a shower, and I thought, okay, with the shower, I want to have it as a moment of just kind of some solitude, but I also wanted to get in a better mood. So I got out my smartphone ahead of time, and I made a list of of, uh, music on there that's relevant to me. So it was everything from uh, a little bit of Bob Marley's Every Little Little Thing's Gonna Be All Right kind of reggae music. I also had some Beatles in there. I had, uh, again, old school hip hop too, and then hair bands as well, and you name it. And the reason why I had the presence of mind to do this is because I've noticed for years that if I go to a health club, more often than not, people are wearing earbuds whether they're lifting weights or running on a track or doing Nautilus. That's because their music could actually motivate them and and, and be an uplifting experience. And so I thought, well, why not for me? I've also noticed over the years, if I go to a stadium event, like say a Vikings game or a a hockey game of some sort, all it takes is a little bit of We Will Rock You by Queen (laughs) to have thousands of people on their feet and clapping their hands and chanting. And that's the power of music. 
So as I took that shower, I wasn't in denial of my circumstance, but it put a spring in my step that I had that music playing. Well, and as I mentioned earlier, I had, of course, my radiation treatments, uh, maybe like five weeks or so after my surgery ended. And I had stitches at the time from here down to here, and my head was partially shaved. And I remember that uh, when I showed a friend of mine the picture of where the stitches had been removed, and my hair was beginning to grow back a little bit, he looked at it and got kind of lightheaded. <laughs> And he said, oh, Jen, no offense, but that picture's kind of creepy. And we laughed about it. And I thought, what a great example of perspective. Because what was creepy to him is beautiful to me. Because the picture shows that I was healing. So my first day in the radiation lab, I was a little bit intimidated because there was this whole wall full of radiation masks. And I had, I had my own radiation mask made, and it felt like bread dough on my face because they had to actually fit it to my face and then have the, the plastic then harden after the fact. And it looks almost like a jousting mask. <laughs> and it has around the parameter of it little buttons that when, I, when I'd be laying on the radiation table, they would hit, uh, actually hit those buttons into the table. That way I couldn't move my head. Like it was just going to be stiff during those radiation sessions. I would also have a Velcro strap around my arms. That way they wouldn't flail off the sides of the table. And so I thought, man, I'm like, I, I knew the radiation wouldn't just hit my tumor. It's going to hit whatever's in its way. That radiation's going to hit my carotid artery and my pituitary gland and my optic nerve and all those things where I just don't want it to be. But I knew logically that I had to be there. So I had to figure out the how. So uh, being the, the consummate uh, extrovert that I am, <laughs> I asked one of the nurses in the, the radiation room, I said, I know you guys have the CD player here with the CDs that you're offering to play for me. And I like pop music, and granted, your CDs are pop music, but they're not my favorite songs. So would it be OK if I make a list on my smartphone again? And I saw that they had a docking station with speakers. That way I could listen to music during each of my three-minute radiation sessions. And they said, oh, yeah, go ahead. So that's exactly what I did. And one day in particular, the song of the day was Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. <laughs> So that's that song, and so I think maybe from the late 70s, early 80s maybe, starts out kind of disco-y, and then the guys start rapping over it. I just, I love this song. So the radiation tech's job, if you will, was to get me on the radiation table, get my mask fastened to my face, have that strap around my arms, and then after leaving me, going into an observation room, and then of course turning on my music along the way, and then once he gets into the, the actual observation room, his job then is to look at a whole wall full of computers. There's a, 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 a window to see me, a microphone to give me any kind of directions or whatever. So over, <laughs> before turning on the radiation, over the music and over the microphone, he says, and today we have a little radiation for the ladies. <laughs> It was almost like we were at a club, <laughs> and, and, and radiation was on the house. <laughs> so I thought, what a beautiful experience, because the laughter, the act of kindness, the music, those were all things that helped lower my stress hormones, and then, of course, increase my feel-good chemicals of the brain. But they also helped him as a caregiver. I mean, I have an immense amount of respect for people who work in hospitals, especially for him being in a, in a um, radiation room where nobody wants to be there. <laughs> you know, patient after patient who's there might be projecting their frustration onto you as the caregiver, even though it's not fair, it's just, it just happens. And so I thought, what a great way to unite us. So now I always tell people, ask your, your physician ahead of time. If you go in, say you go in for one of your tests for your heart, ask ahead of time, do you have a docking station in there? You know, or, or could I bring some earbuds maybe and have a smartphone with my music? Because it can make a huge difference in your experience. So that being said, I'm curious if there are stories uh, out there with you guys right now, uh, whether it's uh, anybody who's, of course, a surgeon. Now, I, I should ask you this. Do you, do, you listen, do you listen to any kind of music when you're performing surgery? Anything that? Good for you. 
Thanks for sharing. Well, and, and Amy, I think you had mentioned in Fargo that, Pete, weren't you at the hospital when all of a sudden an Elton John song came on and you were there to have your heart surgery, I think, and the song was like, don't go breaking my heart. <laughs> and so now, if I remember correctly, the song has meaning for you. Perfect. Mike? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Snoop Dogg, all right, very nice. Nice, very nice. Now, I'm wondering if anybody else has had this particular experience. Have you ever driven, say, for example, from your office to your house or someplace where it's a familiar route to you, and once you get there, you're like, okay, how did I even get here? Like, like you don't remember even driving. There's a term for that that's called highway hypnosis. <laughs> and I was talking to a nurse about that when I was having one of my radiation sessions because I had told her that the last time I was at the hospital, I was listening to a song where I was actually quizzing myself on the lyrics during my radiation session. That way I would forget where I was and the fact that I had radiation coming in my head. And that's exactly what happened. Like literally when the radiation machine turned off, for a split second I was disappointed because I wanted to finish my song. <laughs> Okay, I shouldn't want more radiation in my head, but I, but I seriously forgot where I was, and she equated it to highway hypnosis. Music can have that kind of effect if it's a song that has meaning for you. But anybody else before I close things out? Any, any questions? It could be both. I, I know one person in particular doesn't always listen to music because her, her hospital doesn't always offer it. And um, she mentioned that she's had so many MRIs that she's used to the banging around of the machine around her head. So in her mind, she pretends that she's listening to a symphony. And she'll try to predict, like, there's the snare drum, and there's the bass, and there's the whatever. And really, it's the machine making the noise. But in her mind, it's she's trying to make music out of it. I also heard a story from someone at a nursing home who had to have a number of MRIs. And she didn't have hospital either at, excuse me, didn't have music either at her hospital. But she would lay there and sing to herself in her mind um, songs from when she went to church as a kid. So she would lay there and sing to herself, yes, Jesus loves me, you know, and that would help soothe her while she was having her, her session. So pretty cool stuff. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.